You're listening to The 14th Source for all geeky and nerdy news and discussion, which means that you're listening to a podcast. For all intents and purposes. I am D. Bethel. And I'm Andrew Asplund. And we are your two overeducated, codependent nerd hosts, bringing you the things that we like to talk about, but filtered through an inquisitive and critical lens. In the episode for Friday, April 14th, 2023. And uh, I just want to start here, Andrew. I just want to touch on... I don't want to go into too in depth because I don't want to ruin it for you. But I did end up seeing with with friend of the show Kyron Silva, Dungeons and Dragons. Oh God, what's the subject? Uh, uh, Honor among thieves. Honor, Honor among thieves. Yes. Yeah. What I was kind of hearing around town, meaning the internet, I would say is true. It was uh, it was fun. Yeah. Now it was funny because Kyron and I kind of have the same level of experience with Dungeons and Dragons, which is basically nil. Mm. But it was nice to see. There were a lot of times while watching the movie where I felt like, oh, they're clearly referencing something. And I think it bounced bounced back and forth between equipment or something like that, because there's this one tool that one of the characters had that they kept doing lots of close-ups on. I'm like, oh, that's clearly something that I should recognize or knew anything about Dungeons and Dragons. But they also... Probably. And that's actually... What I'll say is, not to cut you off, but really too... Uh, I do want to see it, and, and I actually have a lot of. Um, I want to see it because one of the things that's that's interesting to me is this: the, what you talked about, this idea of like these iconic things mm-hmm. that are considered quintessential D anD D that aren't story or characters, right? Um, and the idea, and the reason I say this is because like when the trailer came out, the original first trailer, nothing in the trailer evoked any D anD D characters or setting. That we recognize that, like that, although it was, it's actually set in the Forgotten Realms and right. in, in, in Neverwinter. But like the trailer didn't advertise that. The trailer advertised a gelatinous cube right. and a displacer beast. <laughs> right, and like, isn't that they even have like the mimic or or the what yeah, and a mimic. And so it's like it's it's that weird thing about, and I suspect that actually Big D D struggles with this to a certain extent of mm-hmm. like what is the iconic D and D right, like what. You know, whereas, like, Star Trek has characters and settings and worlds, or Star Wars has settings and characters and images. D&D just has, like, unrelated things. Because you know, that's the like, point of the game, right? Like, it's, it's to create your own adventures. It's weird, though, because, like, as a as a book series, as sure. novels, oh, sure, yeah. it was all about specific settings, right? Driz Dwarden and, and Wolfgar the Barbarian, those were characters in the Forgotten Realms. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Forgotten Realms are from the novels, the Dragonlance novels? Well, it's, that's a, it's from, a, it's actually a setting created by Ed Greenwood, who was not credited in the film. Right. Uh, back in, he actually created it as like a storytelling thing for his kids, I think. And oh, then it was, he started writing about it back in the 80s for Dungeons and Dragons. And I think they just basically bought it from him. Right? <laughs> okay. Uh, and he still participated with it for years, writing books. And he's actually a character in the Forgotten Realms. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, Elminster, uh, oh. the, the great wizard. So yeah, so it's a it, it is it's just a, it's like one of the um, the early iconic settings uh, between Blackmore, Greyhawk, and Forgotten Realms. Those are the three that are usually associated with the first ten years, fifteen years of D anD D, and then later they start doing other stuff. So. But it's funny because both Kyron and I were any of the references we picked up were not because we knew anything about D anD D, but because we were familiar with D anD D video games. So like, oh, Baldur's Gate. I heard of that, right? And he, Which is in the Forgotten Realms, right? Yeah. He, yeah, he played those games, and of course, Neverwinter Nights and Neverwinter and um, the Sword Coast or something like that, right? Um, yeah, the Sword Coast. That's the that's the part of the world that both those cities and Waterdeep are in. Yeah, and oh, they mentioned Waterdeep as well. Um, but there's Which also is because it has a deep harbor. Indeed, I think the the, the story does revolve around. And I asked a, another D and D friend about it, and they said, "Yeah, like there's the the story revolves around like a." A piece of of of, of lore that I guess yeah. is pretty common. It has red wizards and shit, right? Um, yeah, the red wizards of Fey, and yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it. That's the thing is the story involves some very uh, forgotten realm stuff, but like it was the idea that in that original trailer, that's not what they were selling because they knew that what right. would get people in the door was the stuff which actually the stuff I hate, which is stuff <laughs> like gelatinous cubes and displacer beasts. <laughs> right, right. I actually was am invested in the setting of Neverwinter and everything else. Right, right. Yeah. But, the thing I would say is like you don't need to know any of that to enjoy the movie, and I think just generally like it's a fun fantasy romp. I don't. Again, I'm not invested in in the in the brand or the world. I thought it was pretty forgettable, but it was not wasted time. Uh, and and I would say that my last sort of thing I'll say is is 
I think it hit that fun fantasy sort of tone better than the Willow show did. They're both very similar in that they're going for a very similar vibe. But the characters in the D&D movie kind of believed the world they were in a bit more than I felt like <laughs> the the Willow characters did. But it's I would say it's like it's a very thin line. But I think they they pulled it off a little bit better in the D&D movie than they did in Willow. So if you're looking if that's what you're looking for in Willow, I think they did a little bit better job in the D&D movie. And the other thing is apparently they went really practical with this movie. Lots of practical effects, lots of huge sets, and that's really it was really cool to see and I think it sold sold it a bit better. Yeah. Um, that is something I did within the week, but not actually what I was going to talk about with this episode because this week we are going to discuss our respective weeks in geek because it's been been a while since we've done this. So even though I guess I kind of talked about one, Andrew, what was your week in geek like this week? I saw the D and D movie. No, um, <laughs> no, actually, I was I was going to talk about uh, something I talked about before, but I want to mention follow up with it. Uh, it's a television series I've been watching or watched, I guess, is uh, Quantum Leap, the new the, oh, right, the, right. the continuation. I don't know what the the sequel uh, right, right. to the original 1980 or 1990 series Quantum Leap. Kind of a requel, like a reboot sequel kind of thing, but not not either. Right, right, right. Uh, so it's, it would ha- so it started you know, uh, what, uh, four or five, six months ago. Uh, you know, they, they did a, an original block of six or seven episodes. Uh, they were picked up for a second half, uh, which they just finished, I think, a week ago. So the, the, the first season is now over. Uh, they have actually they started filming season two. Uh, they have been uh, picked up, but I, I want to talk about just the season that they did because it was a fun show. It, it was a, it it was a fun show that was evocative of kind of what the original Quantum Leap did, but also you know made I think made better use of the time mm-hmm. uh, and and kind of brought some more you know, non, I don't want to say modern, uh, storytelling because it's like none of this is modern. It's all, you know, thousands, hundreds and thousands of years, not hundreds, a hundred thousand, but like storytelling is older than whatever. But the idea of, of the, you know, the way television works and the way that even, uh, the original quantum leap, I mean, um, mm-hmm. which was very like episodic, so episodic that in reruns, they literally could run episodes together and you'd never know that you're watching them out of order, you know? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Because of the way they do the cut to the next episode at the end of each episode, I want to say it was a it, it is a a fun show, and I'm actually uh, I think I think it did great great work. Yeah. Um, you know, for those who don't know, the original Quantum Leap was this like fun romp of of Scott Bakula, uh, you know, basically time traveling, to, leaping into people's bodies and having to fix the things that went wrong in time during that wherever he is. Um, and, you know, the only other real recurring character was his buddy from the future that was a hologram that would give him context but couldn't really do anything other than, te- you know, help him out. Um, this show kind of copies that, but also they added a, a serial story in the background. Um, you know, right. we, where in the original the idea is it starts because Dr. Sam Beckett leaps into the Quantum Leap Accelerator because basically he's worried about getting his funding cut. Here, Dr. Ben Song leaps into the Quantum Leap Accelerator for reasons we do not know when the show starts. But within a couple episodes, we because we, he can't remember it either because that's the fun of Quantum Leap. Um, but over time, we start to figure out what it is. And he had a purpose with leaping. And, and that becomes like an ongoing story of why did he do what he's doing and how that story is playing out in the context of every episode being a new place where he has to help someone you know, who, who, you know, whose life went wrong. Right. Uh, and, and I think they, they did a great job with it. They have a, you know, there's a cast of what's like five people, four or five people. Uh, and, and they, they give them time. So there's, it's not all just set in the past. Uh, mm-hmm. We do mm-hmm. see the team back in modern time solving problems and having discussions and, in and sometimes even engaging with him as a hologram. Um, so I like I like that they 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 took that idea and they expanded it by giving a larger cast and I think all the characters they have all make sense. You know they've got a it's kind of like they've they've got their their team leader they've got the the science person they've got a computer security person they've got the other person <laughs> um, you know and there are certain episodes where certain characters get a time to like be a, a main second cast member right um, right which I yeah and overall I. 
it was a, a good show that also had like that kind of ongoing serialized story. Right. Where from episode to episode, you're like, oh, wow, I wonder what's happening with that. It's not the end of the world, but like there is a, you know, and, and it kind of starts slow where at first you don't know why he, he leapt. And then you find out the reason that he's trying to stop something from happening. So kind of similar to like the the ongoing serialized story in the back of something like Strange New Worlds, where it's like. Or is that even more abstract? Uh, this one's a little bit more involved, right? Because the idea is that you find out pretty quick, oh, he leapt because he's trying to, you know, stop something bad from happening. Right, right, right. Uh, and then he had help, and then they interact with, you know, the, the, the these people. And then eventually it gets even more complicated because, like, there's another Leaper they encounter. Oh, really? Okay. And it's not... It's, you know, it's Leaper X, they call him at first. Um, <laughs> and, and it's not ridiculous like the original uh, series, which literally had, like evil leapers from Satan or some shit. Like, the original series, because the original series gets spiritual in the way that, like, basically he's leaping for God. And <laughs> and there's literally, like, evil leapers that are, like, like I, they're, like, like mustachio-twirling evil people. I had no idea that the original Quantum Leap and Xena were sister shows, but sure. Yeah, and so they, they do, so they have this evil leaper that, or this bad leaper who's, like, trying to cause, like, who's causing problems, but it is not ridiculous. It is like, oh, the context for this makes sense, um, and and they and they kind of bring it all together, and, and you know, and they do some they do some quirky episodes. Uh, there's actually one where they do uh, uh, they have kind of like an event where it's basically he leaps into a, a situation and it goes badly very quickly, mm -hmm. and it, it's kind of like a Groundhog Day, except the shtick here is that he's leaping to the different people in the scene. Mm -hmm. So it's like every leap, hmm. he has a different chance to to fix the problem, but from a different person's perspective. That's interesting. They do they they will explore some stuff. I think in in I think in interesting ways. They they treat some of the things that the original series did, which at the time were probably provocative. Like ooh, he leaps into a woman. Right. Uh, they uh, they handle that stuff. I think a lot better because uh, you know, <laughs> it's not the early nineties. Uh, and I will say that the the actor they have playing uh, Ben Song, Raymond Lee, mm -hmm. he really does well. I mean, there's there's episodes where he leaps into you know people in kind of definitive like culture style dress, and it does feel like he embraces it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like yes, he is now this this the daughter of an Indian restaurateur, <laughs> you know, uh, or whatever the you know the case yeah. may be. They kind of accomplish that thing that the original series did, which was you know giving you perspectives on different people and, mm -hmm. and you know. And making you feel good about humanity, although there's bad guys too, you right, know. Right. Um, yeah, no, I, I think it was. Uh, I, I just enjoyed it, and I actually one thing I will give the series the series credit for is it ends in a way that if they'd not gotten renewed, it would have felt like a, a just a one and done complete show. Oh, cool! I think right. every show should do that with every season because it just feels more whole as well. It feels, you know, and although the joke is that because it's basically like, oh yeah, he's gonna leap home, and for the fact they have a season two, you're like, or not. So I do. <laughs> I will say that the fact that. That they they did that that wrap up at the end that they don't show him leap home but they say like oh yeah your next leap's gonna be home and then it's like oop it's not I, mm -hmm. I do like I do feel that maybe they're they're wrapping it up they wrapped it too hard right <laughs> but yeah no it's it's it is it's a fun show and if you you know I recommend uh, you know anyone that has uh, I guess it's on the Peacock okay which is uh, yet another fucking streaming service yeah um, do you know uh, if it's you, airing on broadcast TV as well. Uh, probably, yeah. Because I don't think Peacock has any any like oh, original program originals. Yeah. Well, actually, I'll say no. I, I so I will say that Peacock may have original programming, but this is not because I actually had been watching it on iTunes. I just bought a season, oh, right. a season pass, which I don't think you, they do that for like the exclusive to the service. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, I know actually like Star Trek: Strange New Worlds just came out on iTunes, and now suddenly it's like. Do you want to buy Strange New Worlds? I'm like, no. Yeah, none of its stuff is airing, <laughs> right? On yeah. broadcast TV. Because it actually used to be, uh, when I was watching Discovery, I'd, I used I waited until I could get it on Blu-ray, and then finally I gave up and got a CBS All Access. If it is broadcast TV and they're aiming for like a primetime demographic, I kind of f worry I know the answer to this, but being the first season, I might be wrong. How long was the season in terms of episodes? Uh, like, gosh, was it 18, 16? So the, I bet a season, with season two, they might bump that to like, the standard 22, 24. It was, it was 18 episodes. I think it was a short run of like eight and then another 10 or something. Right. So they may bump it up. I, honestly, I do. Which is a shame. I, yeah. I mean, I, honestly, the show works because you can, mm -hmm. they can have like episodic that, you know, not, not a lot goes on kind of episodes. And actually they say that the new season two will be less 
serialized because they kind of resolved the big story they had, right. which is fine. I mean, I think the cast is big enough and they and they, they demonstrate that they could have other people like be his hologram in interesting ways that like, like it gives. I mean, one of the things I always say that the, the key to a, a, a show with a cast this size five mm-hmm. is is breaking them up in different ways. Right. Put put the different characters with different pairs. So that way it's not just the same thing every time. That's what I'm seeing here, which is, you know, I, I do. I like that. Right. So that way it's not just. Scott Bakula and Dean Stockwell every fucking episode, right? right? right, right. Like I said, I recommend it. Uh, I think it was a lot of fun. And actually, I think the the next season, I know they're filming it. I don't know when it's going to premiere. Yeah. But you know, sometimes these things are faster than we expect. So or slower. I feel like it's taking a while for like Strange New World season two to get here, but it'll That's get here. Good point. Good point. Yeah, be patient. They got to blend the worlds of cartoons and live action, which can't be fast or cheap. That can, that can't be easy, right? <laughs> but anyway, that is my week in geek, Dan. What about you? Mechs are cool. I like mechs. I don't think I've interacted with a lot of mech media out there, but I've always enjoyed it. And <laughs> Mech media. <laughs> <laughs> a game of old, that I think probably got me interested in mechs before, you know, I don't even know if it's a mech, but the uh, I would say the best mech entertainment out there, Metal Gear Solid. That's totally wrong. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that's totally wrong. <laughs> but was a, a game from, I think, 95? It never came out over here. Published by Square at the time, now Square Enix, called Front Mission, which is basically a tactical strategy game, sort of in the vein of Ogre Battle, not Ogre Battle, Tactics Ogre, um, te- uh, Final Fantasy Tactics, but instead of little people walking in place, you are people piloting mechs on a battlefield. I had encountered it in the mid to late 90s because my friend Josh had modified his Super Nintendo to take Japanese cartridges. Mm -hmm. And so he started importing all the shit he could, right? And one of them was Front Mission. And I just remember being fascinated by it because I don't know if I'd really seen a a tactical strategy role-playing game in that style before because my connection to other types of games and, of course, overseas games was limited. But the art style and knowing it came from the same company as Final Fantasy and just how different Mm. it was because that's sort of science fiction, very gritty kind of style was completely opposite to what what they were doing at the time. What I really liked about it was how granular and modular the systems were in that you, Mm. you had characters in your team and they each had their own mechs and you could swap out parts. It wasn't like you bought a new mech. You could swap out the body. You could swap out both the arms, the weapons each arm has, weapons Mm. in the shoulders, the feet, the, the CPU that they, as they call it, all of it is just stat bumping right right but in ways that felt a little bit more interesting than what you'd seen previously it was always fascinating to me and i always wanted to play it again and not many front missions have come out over here for reasons i don't understand but front mission was eventually ported to the playstation in 2003 and they retitled it Front Mission First. And all they did was just kind of expand some of the options. They added a second branch of the story you could go through. Okay. Um, so it's a pretty substantial port. And so what the game I'm playing now is actually a remake of that port. So the game I'm talking about is Front Mission First colon remake. <laughs> I don't know why that's funny to it's, me. <laughs> it's weird. I mean, I, re, the remake culture in of Jap- Japanese games is like hot right now. We got Final Fantasy Remake. We got all those Resident Evil remakes. Uh, among others. If it gets games released over here that weren't previously released over here, um, then I'm, I'm cool with that. There's two things that are kind of combating my nostalgia playing it again. Uh, one, it is fun. Like, it's a tactics game. It, those, it works the same way, right? A bit more simple. Like, uh, placement around enemies doesn't really matter. Like, placing yourself behind an enemy and attacking doesn't grant you attack bonuses. Or it doesn't look like even um, ground necessarily give you... Well, no, that's not true. Sorry. No. Ground and terrain do provide, you know, cover and whatnot. But the one thing that's really different is between this and the other game, the tr- tactical strategy game that you and I have been playing, Tactics Ogre, that really sets us apart from that is that apparently mech, mech battling is very slow. It's a slow game. <laughs> and <laughs> so, like, I want to get to the part where I had, like, Josh's game back when we played it on the, on the Super Nintendo. I'm like, you had all the money. We're just swapping shit out. I'm like, changing colors and all that stuff but i'm in early game and i have no money and there's lots of story <laughs> and i'm like i want to get to the cool shit right but no you gotta 
You gotta move each mech, and you gotta go through the animation of of them shooting the the enemy, and then shooting back, and then it zooms back out to the map, and it's it's. I had more patience as a child. <laughs> That's what I'm learning. <laughs> But the cool parts are still cool because not only are the the mechs modular in their own way, but when it comes to battle tactics, is that you can also pinpoint specific parts on a on a mech on the mech on your enemy mechs mm. to to knock out their mobility or knock out their weapons or just take them out. And so each limb has its own hit point scale, and that's something you're that's that is always in consideration and what you're looking for when you're swapping up body parts and, and customizing your mech it's it's more than just it's a lot more than just aesthetics right it's a lot and it's it's <laughs> i mean it's one of those things either you, you get into it or it's like oof right it's work right again i'm not too far into it but i kind of have to be in the right mood because mm. otherwise my patience is just not there i'm like i'm just gonna go play it. <laughs> Let's go back to playing Metroid Dread for the 15th time, because that's fast. Either way, it's it's fun, and uh, kind of like Tactics Ogre, it's something I'll probably peck away at for the next four or five years, and and that's okay. It, it's, it's a game that's kind of built for that. The one good thing is that you can save anywhere, anytime, which is nice. That's a nice feature. That's but, always pleasant, you know? That is one of those things I always think about how, when I, when I still see it, like, oh, you can only save your games at the save points. You're like, well, shit. <laughs> I mean, that's something I want to go back into the, I doubt it's there, but I want to go back into the settings. I'm like, I mean, this game is for people like me, not necessarily to get new fans, because it's look it looks old. They also got a graphical overhaul. That's why it's a remake. The PlayStation 1 port was just, in terms of graphics, the port from the Super Nintendo, so sprite-based animation. This mm-hmm. is all 3D okay. models, and it looks really good, I should say. But I want to go into the settings, and it's like, is there something I could just like push a button to have, I don't know, infinite money? <laughs> That'd be great, because I just want to play with the toys more than really dive into this, this gritty dr- science fiction near-future drama of two rival countries fighting over this island, which is fine, but like, I don't know. You just want to blow shit up. I want a cool mech right now. Uh, but yeah, it's fun. It's fun. Uh, obviously, uh, first impressions, but uh, those do matter. And it is equal parts cool and equal parts Dan is too old to be patient to wait for. So yeah, no, I, and we, we're both getting old. I was actually, I've been, I, I will say, I was playing Resident Evil Four remake, and, mm. and every time I get to a frustrating part, I'm like, mm, I yeah. can turn the difficulty down. Yeah, I don't like that they changed the name. It was originally for Resident Evil. Remember oh, the logo? Yeah. The four came first. That's yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> now it's Resident Evil Four remake. So again, they're just it's everybody's remake, remake happy. It's for remake. They're, we're doing it for remake for the cause. So if you, dear listeners, have any thoughts about the topics we discussed this week, feel free to leave your thoughts as comments on the page for this episode at forallintents.net. You can also engage in conversations with other listeners on our Facebook page. You can find us on other social media as well, specifically at the places that both I, Andrew and I frequent. You can find me on Instagram at, at dbethelcomics. You can find Andrew on Mastodon at profounddarkatdice.camp. While you're at our website at forallintents.net, you can also check out our YouTube page, which you may already be there listening to, the show, which is Simulcast on YouTube. Simul, simul, simulcast. simulcast. And if you are listening it there, feel free to like and subscribe, or as the kids like to say, ring that bell. We use two tracks of music for our show. One is called Disco Medusi, the other is called District 4. And they're both written and performed by Kevin McLeod, the Clan McLeod, immortal swordsman, graph paper enthusiast, and musician extraordinaire. You can find his music at incompetech.filmmusic.io, and that's all licensed under the Creative Common 4.0 Attribution License. If you'd like the show and like to help us out, the best way to do so would be to subscribe to the show using whichever podcasting service you happen to use. What would help us out even more, though, would be to leave some sort of review, whether a text review or using their proprietary metric will help spread the word to new potential listeners through the magic of algorithms. Algorithms. Okay, so I have to post a, a little response to last week's episode. Okay, okay. Where we talked about, you know, big Star Trek news. Oh, first oh that's right. Because at the time of recording, First Contact Day hadn't happened. It did happened. not happen. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there was no big news. <laughs> yeah. 
they announced nothing. Uh, in fact, it's weird. It, here's the weird thing. The week before, they announced a new series, Starfleet Academy. Right. <laughs> and then the week after, this week, the, there's other Star Trek news that, uh, let's see, Modifius, the, the role-playing game company, announced they're doing a Lower deck Star Trek Adventure supplement. Oh, interesting. But, like, but there's no no news on First Contact Day. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, aside from personal reasons, uh, it basically, they should have just called it No Contact Day. Yeah. Just been, it was just a day. It was just Wednesday. Yeah. As it is. So until you first contact or no contact someone, dear listeners, I'm D. Bethel. And I'm Andrew Asplund. And for all intents and purposes... That was a podcast. Pew, pew, pew! I'm a mech. <laughs> Brother! That's my liquid snake. Brother! Is that what that is? Brother! You can also... Can you? <laughs> Jesus Christ. You can list your accomplishments. What? Yes, do. Uh, list your CV. You're going on the internet with your Netscape. Right. <laughs> you ask Jeeves. You were listening to... Wait, let me... I, I want to see it. I want to see it. I want to see my waveforms. Mm. As miserable as expected? Yeah, it wasn't great. <laughs> <laughs>